I'm Jay from the Starling Tribune, a podcast member of the Gunny Geek Network, just like the one that you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all other podcasts at gunnygeeknetwork.com and get ready because geekiness starts in three, two, one. You have been granted clearance by director Phil Coulson. Stand by for S.H.I.E.L.D. debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the S.H.I.E.L.D. director. Now it's time for your scheduled debriefing. I'm Agent Stargate Pioneer. I'm Agent Haley. And I'm Agent Lauren. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a Marvel Comic Universe podcast. This is podcast number 65 on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Season 2, Episode 14, Love in the Time of Hydra. This podcast is recorded on Wednesday, March 25th, 2015. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a fan-based podcast on the ABC television show Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Marvel's Agent Carter, and the general Marvel comic universe because of reconnecting. If you'd like to talk to us about reconnecting, you can contact us at our website, legendsofshield.com, on our voicemail, 844-THE-BUS-1, that's 844-843-2871. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr, all at Legends of Shield. You can find us on our YouTube page by searching Legends of Shield. And you can find us on our forums at forums.gunnageek.com or search Gunna Geek on the Tapatalk app. And welcome to our very first live broadcast on our YouTube channel on gunnageek.com slash live. So if you haven't already, check us out there at gunnageek.com slash live Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. And just to let everybody know, we are now available on TuneIn, which is another app and podcast distribution source. So welcome to all of our new TuneIn listeners. We are also still available on the podcast source app, Spreaker, Mixcloud, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, GunnaGeek.com, LegendsOfShield.com, and LegendsOfShield.Lipson.com. So there's a lot of places to find us now. You know, when you said we are now available... My first thought was to do parties. <laughs> <laughs> parties, juggling. Hire us for your next bar mitzvah. <laughs> right, right. So because of all of this, we have picked up a lot of new listeners. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody that has new to the podcast. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Thank you for downloading all of our podcast episodes. And we'd like to hear a little bit more about you. So why don't you go ahead and give us some contact on our voicemail line, on our Facebook, Twitter. Go ahead and email me, StargatePioneer at GunnaGeek.com and let us know about you and how you heard about us. I'd really like to know that. We need to know if we are available to go to your birthday party, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We're not really busy. If any of us are nearby. <laughs> yeah, when's your birthday? We'd love to know that so that we can pop in and perform live. Credit card number, that sort of thing. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so this week, we had a lovely Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. episode. See what I did there? Love in the Time of Hydra. It was a... I've heard a lot of talk about it being kind of a setup episode, but it was written by Brent Fletcher, who has a ton of cred. He's got four episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. behind him. Hand in the Wolf House, Providence, The Magical Place, and Girl in the Flower Dress. Ooh. And he's also been co-executive producer on the series. He's also been producer of Spartacus, War of the Damned, and worked on both Futurama and Angel. So, got some experience on this. He's worked with a few Whedons before. Yeah, right. <laughs> he was also directed by Jesse Bakko, and he's got a, a, a couple of direction in the geek realm, a couple of Prison Break couple of Commander-in-Chief, a lot of other TV, just not really geeky or comic booky stuff, but he is pretty experienced, which I got that feeling from this episode where it wasn't the strong comic book episode that we've gotten in the past, especially when we're dealing with Adama in the conference room on the Battlestar Galactica. Oh, he's Steven Bochco's son. 
Oh, no wonder. Okay. Any of y'all who are fans of Franklin and Bash, which is, I think, still on the air, and any of y'all who were fans of, oh God, what else did Stephen Bochco do? A lot of stuff. Stephen Bochco's in a lot of stuff. He was big back in the 90s, wasn't he? Yeah, it's just that right now, the biggest thing that I can remember him from is Franklin and Bash, because anytime I watch TNT, they always do commercials for it. I think NYPD Blue is a thing that he did. Uh-huh. L.A. Law. That's it. L.A. Law. Uh, That's the big one. And Cop Rock. Which would explain Blair Underwood, too. Yeah. Yeah, huh. last week, which we didn't see him this week, but we didn't need to. We got enough of him last week to last a little while. But we did see a lot of other characters. You know, at the top of my notes, I always say, okay, where are these people? So, okay, where is Deathlock? Where are the Koenigs? They've been gone for a while. What are Cal and Gordon up to right now? Where is Reyna? Those are the wares. Right. But we actually got to see a lot of where people are, like Agent Ann Weaver, the head of the former Shield Science and Technology Academy. She's in Edward James Olmos. It was great seeing Admiral Adama back on the bridge of his great helicarrier <laughs> with the mustache. <laughs> the stash is back. Yeah, the, the stash is back. <laughs> Let me ask you guys, was the ship flying or was it in the ocean? It was hard for me to tell. It was in the ocean. It was in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, OK. He doesn't need no fancy flying ship. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Adam <laughs> no. in the chat said back in the Stargate Command. Yeah, it was a little, it's, you know, that 50s. I thought it, I thought it looked like the silo level of Goldeneye. Yeah, that too. See, I <laughs> thought that it looked exactly like the same set as the bus just redressed. It did. Like the staircase was exactly the yeah. same. Shinier. And expanded, wider. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, okay, just take the bus and make it darker and throw some books on there and just have people walking through it looking busy. Right. They were playing Gattaca, you know. <laughs> it looks a lot different with that many people on it. It does. It does. It, so the bus is really a C-17 in disguise. It's not very wide. It's wide enough to throw a tank in there and that's about it. What we saw was wider than that, in my opinion. But maybe it's the magic of set dressing. I don't know. Well, it's a set, not an actual plane. I don't know if you realize that. No, I don't. Yeah, if they can do some of the weird biology stuff and sins against science that they get away <laughs> with, they can fudge a plane a bit. I'll bet. Besides, this one's a boat. <laughs> so it was teased that we were going to have Agent Hartley back, and all we had was mention of Agent Hartley. We didn't actually see her. And matter of fact, they said that they basically confirmed that she was dead. Now, I don't know if I believe it or not, but they did confirm that. Like I said, the article we had last week said we'd see the actress again and the character again, but it didn't say it would be in present day. I feel like we're probably going to get a flashback to her saving Adama Gonzalez. Hear me out. Okay. Hear me out. Deathlock Hartley. Oh. I did say robot arm. Yes. Yes. I 100% support this plan. <laughs> it's probably just going to be a flashback, but we can hold our breath. We can cross our fingers. I would prefer robot arm Xena. That's what I want. That's what you've been saying all along since we saw the episode. <laughs> yep. I think it's a waste of perfectly good character development to cut off her arm and not give her a robot arm. Well, I think that anybody could deserve a robot arm, especially if you're an archer. <laughs> 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 Just you never know if the skin's going to match. <laughs> so we also have Agent Thomas Calderon, who, please help me Yay. out on this name, Kirk. Kirk Acevedo. He was on Fringe. He's amazing. He was on Fringe, and he's also yes. currently on 12 Monkeys, and he's playing really? a great character there. If you haven't been able to check out 12 Monkeys yet, please do so. They only have a few more episodes in this season. It's a great sci-fi, and by sci-fi, I mean Skiffy show. It's one of their better ones that they've had in a very long time. He was on the latest Planet of the Apes movie, too. Yeah, that's what oh, I heard. He played a total D-bag. <laughs> <laughs> he can go either way. He can play the good guy, and he can play the D-bag. He plays a really good D-bag, though. Yeah, but he was so good on Fringe. Just, I miss Charlie <laughs> so much. <laughs> yeah, it, Fringe, I, I miss Fringe. And I'm going to have to go back and rewatch that because it was a great show. But he was great on everything that I've seen. He hasn't had a bad role. It's awesome. And then we also get, and I don't know who this guy is, Agent Oliver, Mark Allen Stewart. I don't recognize Mark. Is that the guy with the beard? 
Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I had no idea who that guy was. I don't even remember if he spoke or not. Agent not appearing in any <laughs> other episode. <laughs> he does have voice acting credits, including Legend of Korra and Disney's Planes, but hey. I wouldn't recognize it. Legend of Korra. Very good. Who did he play in Legend of Korra? I don't know. I didn't write that down. Now I'm going to have to look Jeez. it up. <laughs> I'm just going to interrupt. Just letting you know. I'm just going to interrupt okay. in like five minutes and be like, oh, that's who he played. Oh, good enough. Good enough. It was great seeing them. I wonder what happened to all the Science Academy students. I bet a lot of them went to work for Hy Hydra. I was just going to say, I bet you half went to Hydra and then some of them died probably. And then some of them came over to S.H.I.E.L.D., whatever S.H.I.E.L.D. that is. So we get a lot of talk about pumpkin pancakes and pecan syrup. Mm, pumpkin pancakes. <laughs> I've never had it. Are they good? It's pecan, not pecan, damn it. <laughs> I will fight you. <laughs> okay, pecan. So, Agent 33, though, it doesn't seem decisive at all until the very end of this episode. Well, I don't blame her. She's had her entire memory wiped. Just all of her being is gone. We saw her be tortured and we saw her... Basically, she didn't get deprogrammed. The person who conditioned her was killed. She's left adrift and left with, of all people, Ward. <laughs> who she thinks is well adjusted <laughs> it's like what man yeah i had to talk to my parents and my family and let's just leave it at that i had to move on after that yeah well i mean what do you do go to prison the electric chair maybe i don't know no it's i honestly really feel for agent 33 uh kara carol carol kara i thought it was kara i heard kara i heard carol i heard kara bummer so goes my hearing <laughs> anyway yeah she was wishy-washy, was trying to be Ward's sky, which was so creepy. Oh, so creepy. You got May's voice. It was sad. You got Sky's face, and you've got Agent 33 behind there trying to make Ward like her, love her, whatever. I'm like, oh, man, you are one screwed up woman. She was... Okay, so hear me out. I think she was trying to... Like she said, she has nothing to give him. I think she feels that she owes him for... I don't know, taking her in. And the only thing that she really has on her is the ability to change her face. And the only thing that she really, really knows about Ward is what little she saw of him that he has a thing for Sky. And I think it was just the sad attempt to reach out with the only thing that she has. I don't think it's creepy. I think it's just desperately sad. She has no identity at this point. She's reaching for an identity. And it's... I. Honestly, of everybody in this episode, she's the one who I felt the most for. I just, I feel so horrible for her. I feel very bad for her. And I wish that she would find somebody better to hang around with than Ward. She does not deserve him, like, somebody that bad. She deserves to be around somebody who will actually help her through it and not mess her up worse. Do you think that her weak-mindedness in being brainwashed to begin with had something to do with that? I don't think it was weak-mindedness. We saw her being tortured for hours. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it was just that she bent so far that- Hydra's gotten really good at brainwashing. Yes. Okay. So whoever you are, if you're going to be in that situation, you're going to be brainwashed no matter what. I think that they had to work so hard on her that it bent her way further than any person should. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be a little bit of why she's like this. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see. It seemed like she was starting to recoil against Ward a little bit, but then he brings her the present of Bakshi, and I don't know what happened there. Did Bakshi, like, deprogram her, or did, because Bakshi was there, she suddenly remembered who she was? I mean, how did that work? She remembered, I think, little fragments of things that happened, but I don't think... It's like that thing where you can look at pictures and you can sort of remember objectively what happened, but... Like, with trauma and with memory loss, things like that, you might not be able to remember in the moment. And I think she might have remembered objectively, he's the one who brought me to Whitehall to be tortured and brainwashed. Mm. And he's the one that she can focus all of her anger on. Right. She did seem to remember enough either to find a picture or remember her face. I don't even know how that would work, so that the mask showed her as she originally was. And at the end of the episode, you actually had the actress who was playing Agent 33 coming back, and that was good to see after all this time of not being her. 
I thought she probably pulled a personnel file or something while she was in the military base to get her picture. Oh. But I don't know for sure. I thought she took off the mask because her face was still messed up. Oh, yeah, I guess that's possible. Or deactivated the mask or something. But she did activate the mask again and her face was healed as the original Agent 33 at the very end. I have a picture of that. She's, uh, now I can't remember. I'm going to have to rewatch it because I think she turned around at one point in time. Yeah, they said that they couldn't remove it. Right. But it was actually, I mean, it was her, it, the mask portraying her original face. Maybe he took a picture, the doctor that they kidnapped, of her injured face. But with regards to her original face, yeah, I, the most plausible explanation would be either she remembered or she took a picture from the base. Okay. Fair enough. I still swore that it was the injured face, though. Okay. Are we agreeing that the doctor that fixed her is dead? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. He's dead. Yeah. yeah. He is so dead. Ward killed him. Ward took care of that. Yep. All right. So Fitz and Simmons are arguing over Sky's powers, and Sky doesn't like it one bit. Uh, well, again, it's one of those things where the argument isn't really about what the argument is about. Okay. <laughs> so the argument is about what? The argument is about, well, it's like Fitz says, Simmons has not been able to accept that maybe this is just who Fitz is now with regards to his brain damage. She's like, oh, we need to fix you. We need to fix you. Oh, we need to fix Sky. We need to fix her. And he's like, why can't you just accept that maybe this is my new status quo? Why can't you just accept that maybe this is who she is now? And it's very personal for him because... This is who he is now. You see this a lot with the disabled community in real life, where people are always saying, oh, this is how we're going to fix you. And with regards to the blind community, the deaf community, the chronically ill community, the neurodivergent community, like people with autism, people on the autism spectrum, things like that, where they consider this a part of who they are, it comes across as very insulting, very patronizing. Mm. So I think it's something like that. Okay. Richard in the chat said something funny. Sky smash. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. She's definitely going to be. It'll be, you know, in the previews for next, have you guys seen the previews for next week? Yeah. Actually, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but yes, keep talking. <laughs> in the previews for next week, they, or the rest of the season, I it was a little confused on that. I thought it was going to be next week. The episode that you never thought you'd see. They did show... It looked like the new shield or Adama shield or what are we going to call it? The fleet. Let's just call it Adama shield. Adama shield. So Adama shield is coming in on Quinjets on Sky's location. So May is communicating with Sky somehow. I'm not sure. She seems to be flying something and she's telling Sky to run. And so you have these planes coming in. We're going to see Sky do something with her powers and with these new armbands. I don't think they'll be her final armbands, but. They're an improvement on nothing, so I want to see what happens. Yeah, Simmons has been building the armband she's gotten so far, and they're mostly just for healing and stuff. I think Fitz is going to be the one that gives her something that lets her channel her powers. It did sound like they were meant to channel the powers, but... More suppress. Suppress, you think? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, and then don't forget, we got Gordon out there, too, so he could flash in and take her and flash out, so... She's got some rescue there. So, looking at the comics, I've been looking this past week, and it looks like Daisy Johnson in the comics, Quake, wears these, like, gauntlets. Her armband gauntlets? Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see, first of all, if Sky continues to wear some sort of gauntlet -y device from now on, and if so, what they'll look like. I think she'll have to just for self-preservation until she learns how to control her powers a little bit better. It just seems like the way that they're going to go down. I don't see her not wearing armbands from now on. Just like Reyna, it's like from now on, you're not going to see flowers. You're going to see the Reyna that is today. You're going to see spinity. Right, right. So you've got the, I don't know what to call it. It's not really an interrogation. Uh, whatever it is that they bring Lance Hunter in in the conference room. And they're trying to sway him. I don't know why they're even trying to sway him. Why not just lock him up in the brig, like Agent Thomas says. I don't understand why they're trying to talk him out of it, but they do. Because they needed to do an info dump for the audience. Yeah, there you go. Also, I suppose because Bobby 
likes him and thinks he's valuable, they might as well try to get him on their side. So Robert's trying to play to Bobby's a little bit, maybe? Possibly. Bobby Morris? Yeah. Okay. So, but they bring up some really good points, right? Colson has alien DNA in him. He had the writing and they searched for the city once they found out what the writing was. He said he was reckless. Robert said that Colson was reckless in his pursuit of alien tech, that Hartley's death could have been prevented, that he blamed him for Tripp's death, he blamed him for Raina's transformation, and they don't know how effective Sky is, but they blamed him for Sky as well. So there's a lot of blame being thrown at Colson right now. But in retrospect, do you think that they could have done any better? How weird is it to see Admiral Adama playing Tom Zarek in this? <laughs> <laughs> I actually tweeted that it was fine to put alien DNA in your presidential girlfriend. <laughs> but again, it's like, remember back when Battlestar Galactica was on for all of those who watched it? If you watched what Adama and Rosalind were doing from the point of view of an outsider, somebody who was not in the point of view of the audience, they were making some really shady decisions. And it could be argued that Zarek had a point. And if you talk to Richard Hatch at a convention and ask him about this, be prepared to have your ear talked off for at least a half hour about it. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> or two. Or two. But it's kind of the same situation here from, you know, the God's eye view of the audience. We see exactly the points from A to B to C that Colson is taking. From the point of view of somebody who is not in the inner circle, we see from A to C, and it's nothing but disasters in between. Right. And they don't know that Coulson picked him and put him in charge either. They think he just, you know, on a whim decided, hey, I'm going to start S.H.I.E.L.D. and be in charge of it. Do you think Fury's going to come back? Yes. And say, look, Coulson's it. Go away. I don't know if he's going to come back and say that, but he's going to come back in Avengers. And I think people are going to be made aware of the fact that he's not dead. Hmm. Even if he did come back, do you think they'd listen at this point? Because they were so dissatisfied with how things were run and how it fostered an environment where Hydra could flourish? It's hard to say. Yeah. Do you think they're actually going to get their hands on the toolbox? For conflict's sake, I think so. Okay. I think that might be the season finale. Are they going to be able to open it up and see what's in there? Because that might open their eyes a little bit. That, I don't know. Okay. What do we think their intentions are? Are they purely good? See, I don't know. I think some of them might still be Hydra. There's always that potential. Yeah. You just can't, you can't go all the way that they are all good because it could have come down to six people in a room, five are shield and one's Hydra and, and the one Hydra who hasn't revealed him or herself yet might say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm with shield just to, you know, prevent being killed or something. So I could see that as still. I think Agent Beardley is the Hydra agent. Eh. The one, sir, not appearing in any yeah. other episode before now? Because they're making it seem like the other guy is confrontational and stuff all the time. It's not him. It's the guy that doesn't talk. I'm putting my quarter on it. I can see that. Yep. Okay. All right. I really don't want it to be Kirk Acevedo because I liked him so much in Fringe. <laughs> he's a good actor. No, he's going to get killed. He no. is so dying. He's dying. <laughs> not again. <laughs> he's not making it through this season. <laughs> he's already died a couple of times in 12 Monkeys, too. So, spoilers. <laughs> He died, like, I think t once or twice in Fringe spoilers, but... <laughs> I mean, when you have alternate universes, does it even matter? I don't know. Uh, yes, it does. You get so attached. But anyway. Right. <laughs> Adam in the chat said, the toolbox will probably send an alert to Fury when they do pick it up. Probably. So, I could see that. Maybe that's the call out to Fury. That toolbox has been appropriated by somebody other than Coulson. That's a lot of tech in there. Well, okay. So, it's never too early for Taco Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> Everything with Talbot was just kind of amazing. I mean, the whole thing with his wife, he, <laughs> he carpet-faced his wife. <laughs> She's like crying, I even got the stuff that you wanted. <laughs> I'm trying to pick out which of his staff was the infiltrator. <laughs> it's just kind of picking at that poor woman's face. Yeah. I wonder how many times they all cracked up because it didn't look like they were completely holding it together in the take no. they used. <laughs> right. Adrian Pazdar is actually a really good comic actor, but he just does not have the face that would kind of hint you into that. <laughs> Does your daughter go to school with my son? I don't have a daughter. No, that's right. How many times have I gotten your name correct? 
You've never gotten my name rank. Zero, sir. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> That's funny. That'd be me. How many times did I get your name right now? Okay. <sighs> That's how we know that you're an alien when you start getting the names, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. When I've been appropriated <laughs> by the aliens and replaced, or a robot, that too. Yeah, or by Agent 33. Like the last Starfighter. You, you'll know when I'm <laughs> off fighting some galactic battle. I was just watching that the other day. Yeah, that's great, right? So in any general's office, that's what happens, right? They sit down and they start talking about riding mowers. Superior cut, <laughs> two hands, four wheels, one saddle. One saddle. <laughs> it's great. Wow. <laughs> but it did, to me, depict how bought in at this point in time Talbot is with Coulson's shield. And then when this other shield comes in, I think he's going to side basically with Coulson's group. I think so. I kind of hope so. Yeah. And if he doesn't, that'll be fun too. This is just a fun show. Well, if this goes public, Coulson's going to be the one with the Avengers support. That's true, because he is an Avenger. <laughs> That's right. He is. So, Bobby just lets Hunter escape, and I'm surprised that this doesn't really come back at her. They're like, okay, what do you want to do about it? She's like, well, I'll go in. Six hours. I only need six hours. So, I was a bit surprised that they didn't question her on why they let him go or anything like that. I really hope she's double-crossing them, because I want Bobby to be on our side. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think she's thinking I'll be the one that goes in and handles things because if anybody else goes in, bad things are going to happen. Yeah. Bad things are going to happen anyway. But, oh, I like Bobby. Just, no. Yeah. I want things to go well. Why can't things ever go well? Because <laughs> it would make for bad TV, I guess. I don't know. I know, but why can't we just have an episode where everybody hangs out and plays video games and they just have a nice day? This is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> and eats edible arrangements. Yes. <laughs> just drowning in edible arrangements. Do you ever get the feeling that you've mishandled something important? For <laughs> marriage. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I, the whole time with Sky, the whole licorice thing, the whole comparison. Oh, that's you're going on a road trip with dad and he brought snacks. Oh, it was great. It was. She did mention the whole old yeller thing, though, be well, to begin yeah, with. Yeah, kind of. But when she was like, I need you to stop being an agent and start being, and I was thinking, dad? But no, and then <laughs> she said my friend, and I'm thinking she totally wanted to say dad. I have to bring this up. I have to revisit something that we passed by. Cajun Sean in the chat said, I think Hunter didn't really escape, and he is hiding out on the ship. Hmm. That would make a lot of sense. Possible. Yeah. True enough. Now he's the sneaky one. What do you think of that, <laughs> Mockingbird? <laughs> Mockingbird. Mockingbird. Yeah, and I mentioned it before. I didn't think Coulson believed Mac at all, and he didn't. And neither did May. Yeah, so yeah. they're going to play him somehow. I just don't know how it's going to It's not going to be as easy as Bakshi, but they're going to do something. Seriously, that weak-ass excuse, you got to think of something a little better. <laughs> Did you see Bobby? No, ships in the night. No, I didn't see her. Really? Who says that? Who in real life says that? Somebody in their 60s. <laughs> <laughs> so Max 60 now, huh? Well, no, it wasn't his line. Okay. Simmons would be disappointed to learn that Mac would be 60. All right. <laughs> no, uh, Fitz would be disappointed. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's yep. right. Yep. Get your shipping right. I'm, yes, yes. I'm confusing the science babies and the science babysitters. Okay. Yes. Okay. Will compliance be rewarded anymore? Doesn't really matter. There you go. Yeah. I mean, oh man, that was twisted, but at the same time, I couldn't really falter. And yeah, I mean, he's kind of got it coming. Total setup episode. I enjoyed the small reveals, like Agent, uh, what's her name? Agent Ann Weaver. Saw her again. Agent Adama. <laughs> Admiral Adama. Admiral Rowe. I, what do we want to call him? I'm forever going to call him Admiral Adama. <laughs> Yeah, he's Adama. Forever my Admiral. <laughs> Not even Agent Adama? Nope. All right. So, Admiral Adama, it was good seeing him back on TV. Like, wow, that's awesome. It didn't need to be with that mustache, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he shaved it off before on TV. He could shave it again. Yeah, when he shaves it off, that's when you know that he means business. So, we got to watch out for that. Right. And if my years of TV watching have taught me anything, it's that if you see somebody shave on screen, they will cut themselves. <laughs> it can't be helped. <laughs> right. Speaking of shave, Ward lost the beard of evil. He did. Yeah, but right now he has the scruff of malicious intent. Oh, okay. Scruff of malicious night. And the buzz cut of badness. 
<laughs> I wonder if 33 is going to Carol. Car- no, it's not Kara. Kara. I wonder if Kara is going to uh, give him a haircut. He doesn't really need a haircut. He needs to let no. it grow out a little bit. I was going to say, he doesn't need anybody to give him a haircut. He gave himself a haircut. I don't know what I was thinking there. All right. Well, what do you guys have on this episode that we haven't talked about already? Fitz wants a dog now. Oh, that's yeah. right. I, it, do you think that's true? Because the monkey's kind of part of the whole shebang. Well, they probably said absolutely no on a monkey. So he's like, well, can I have a dog then? But he's got a monkey in the comics. The thing is that he needs to learn to negotiate. You start with a monkey, and then you move down to lemur, and then you move <laughs> down to ferret. And then you start moving down to like chinchilla and rabbit. <laughs> well, no, I guess dog before rabbit. <laughs> well, maybe both. Maybe you have dog and rabbit. And then you just pick the one or the other. Where's horse? A uh, horse is above <laughs> monkey. I was going to say, yeah, they don't have enough room for a horse on the bus. <laughs> well, you take a look at Firefly. They had a whole herd of cattle in that thing. Horses need more room than cattle. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Not by much. I mean, cows, they just kind of sit Mill there. about. <laughs> Richard in the chat says, Sky Bison. <laughs> <laughs> that yes. would be amazing. That's funny. Yes. Too bad I can't do a Scottish accent or else I just would have tried the yip yip thing right now. <laughs> okay, what else we got? Do we have any quotes? Yes. Oh, please. She made it pretty clear the feeling wasn't mutual. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Understatement of the week. Yeah. When you get shot four times. Yep. Yeah. I just keep thinking of this old uh, Wanda Sykes routine where she's talking about how her mom and dad are telling her that divorce is just the easy way out. Just like, your father and I, we don't get divorced. Your mom shot me one time. You see that? That's <laughs> love right there. <laughs> Dealing with it the old fashioned way. <laughs> okay, so when Talbot pulled all the women into <laughs> yeah. the secret room, of course they're all accounted for. Because you have one copy of everybody. Right. Like, there could still be one wandering about. Uh-huh. Well, he d- can't think outside the box that the <laughs> mask lady actually turned into a guy. So, that's the false thing. Well, no, even if she was still a woman, there could still be a woman out there. Everyone's accounted for because he has one copy of everybody. Right. But, whatever. Yeah. Anything else? Don't try to stop me. I won't. Everybody else will. Right. As soon as you open the door and the other two shield agents, they're shield agents, right? And the other two shield agents, whatever, go after him. And then he just <laughs> runs through the control room. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the scariest change is? Is you. Ooh. Yep. It's kind of true, though. Right. The best quote. I might just have to test that theory out on your face. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <sighs> I don't good. know why, but your mom and your face jokes just get me every time. <laughs> They're never going away, ever. No. <laughs> right. I make your face jokes every day at work. Yeah. Every day. Oh, really? Wow. Every day. Nice. All right. Okay, and then my last note, not a quote, is that I wonder if Agent 33 might be some sort of version of Madame Mask. Huh. I don't know who this Madame Mask is. Iron Man villain. Yeah, old Iron Man villain. Her face was horrifically scarred, and she wore a metal mask to hide it. Hmm. And she had an affair (laughs) with a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, and then dumped him for Iron Man. Drama, drama, drama. Recently, in the Hawkeye comics, Kate Bishop impersonated her, and she took that very personally and went after her. (laughs) (laughs) Well, May doesn't like it either, so... But can she do May anymore? She can only do three at a time, so I wonder what she's got in there, in her uh, memory. I think she's keeping the Mayface. I suppose it would just be a picture thing, so no big deal anymore. Okay. Well, it was a good episode. I'm looking forward to next week. What about you ladies? Of course. Well, yeah, I definitely need to see where things go from here. Need to see the return of Admiral Adama's mustache. (laughs) (laughs) The cane and the mustache. All right. We'll be looking forward to next week. In the meantime, we're going on to the news. So, we had some ratings this week, didn't we? We did. Pretty similar to last week. We're at 4.29 million viewers live plus same day. All right. So, I did a little research over the weekend, just like I did last week with Agent Carter. I went back to the beginning of Season 2 and tried to pop up the Live Plus 7 ratings. And it's pretty steady. It's in the low 60s to mid 70s. And every single week 
they're first or second in the amount of percentage of increase between the Live Plus same day and the Live Plus 7 viewing, which is really good. I think they're competing on a weekly basis with Forever, which I have not seen that show, but I guess Forever gets a lot of downloads as well. Now, on their ratings for the week, they go on the top 25 shows on the week, they're in the middle. They're in the middle third, and they're either in the low part of that middle third or the high part of that middle third. But they do really well in the Live Plus 7, so that's got to account for something in the renewal and the ad areas for the show. So really looking forward to a Season 3 announcement. I have no idea when that's going to be, but probably targeting... What does ABC do? May? Is that when they do it? I think May, yeah. Yeah. They're apparently one of the last networks to announce pickups. Okay. Well, because of the movie schedule for Marvel, I don't see this changing anytime soon. Right. And all the Netflix stuff they've got planned... No matter what the ratings are, I bet the show goes five seasons. Right. So anyway, that was interesting. I'll put that information in the show notes as we go along. And we kind of have some big non-news ahead of us, right, Haley? Right. Apparently, the role of Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers, may have been cast. That is the latest rumor. No names associated with this casting, but Latino Review is saying that Carol Danvers has been cast and that she's potentially going to show up in Age of Ultron. Woohoo! Woo! Which gets to another news story that's farther down the pack. Mr. Wheaton has been doing some interviews, and by interviews I mean corporate publications because Marvel's doing their own interviews with him. Imagine that. And he has basically said that there will be some new characters of the Marvel Universe that are introduced in Age of Ultron, which were like, duh, but Captain Marvel is definitely one of them. I have no idea who the rest are, but he said plural, so we'll see what pops out of that. And I'm really interested to see who they've cast as Captain Marvel. Do you think they're just trying to make this a surprise for opening weekend, or do you think it'll release before then? If they can keep it a secret, I think they will. Yeah. It's so hard to keep secrets these days, but... Unless you're Marvel. Yeah, that does not stop people from trying. I think if we hear anything, and if she is in Age of Ultron, we won't find out until probably the week before. Mm, right. Well, I'll see the movie anyway. I mean, we're going to see it <laughs> Uh, yeah. Friday, Saturday. Some of us will Thursday. probably see it Thursday. Well, yeah. yeah, I'll see it Thursday, and then probably again Saturday afternoon. Ditto. And then we'll podcast about it Sunday afternoon live on the geekgeek.com slash live page. So, so put it in your calendars, yeah. everybody. What did we say? Uh, four o'clock... Eastern, 3 o'clock Central, or is that shifted an hour? I can't remember. I think that sounds right. I don't know. Okay. Sounds right? It'll be late Sunday afternoon, so... It's a little ways off still. Yeah, just keep your ears open. We'll be out there. And then we got a couple of new episode titles for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Episode 16, Afterlife, and Episode 17, Melinda. Which is Agent May's first name. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what those turn out to be. And then also... We get our first look at a Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. character, Luke Mitchell. Yes, Luke Mitchell, who was in The Tomorrow People with Robbie Amell, is going to be an inhuman in an upcoming episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And we've got a picture of him walking out of some doors in jeans and a sweater. So, that's it. <laughs> jeans and the sweater. Is it, you think yep. the sweater is going to come off? It better. He. <laughs> <laughs> it's ABC, though. It's not CW. I don't know if this show is anything like the Tomorrow People. He has a severe fabric allergy and can't have <laughs> clothing on his torso for very long periods of time. <laughs> okay, in principle, I am generally okay with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there was some sort of competition between him and Robbie Amell about who could do the most scenes without a shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> Why I not? approve. So they would read the script and then go talk to the director and be like, so for this scene, I don't need to be wearing a shirt, do I? <laughs> I think there needs to be equal opportunity here. We need to have more female characters do the same thing. So, just saying. That's fine. It's fair. <laughs> okay. Also, what's fair is in Daredevil, they're saying that it has more stunts than any TV show. Well, okay. Scott Glenn did an interview on YouTube, and it's an IGN interview. And, you know, it's Scott Glenn. You, you like listening to the guy, at least I do. I remember him from a lot of different things. And he was really intrigued about the intensity level 
of the show, and he had to step up his game. So we'll see what the action is like in the show. Well, considering that he's playing stick, yeah, he needs to step up his game for that. <laughs> in regards to having the most stunts, this is coming from the team that did Spartacus. So I'm <laughs> curious as to how that stacks up. Yeah, more stunts, fewer blood fountains. Yeah. yeah. Probably fewer <laughs> penises, too. One would assume, but it is Netflix, so yeah. who knows? True. Yeah, th I'm looking forward to the topless scenes, because there's going to be some. I'm just... Well, yes. There's going to be some. Okay, and Haley, you were saying that you picked up something on AKA Jessica Jones as well. Right. I was just cruising through IMDb, like I do, and I noticed that it said that the potential premiere date for AKA Jessica Jones is December 2015. Now, I don't know if that's actually based on anything, or if IMDb is just guessing based on what Netflix said earlier this year that the show is supposed to premiere before the end of the year. If so, best Christmas gift ever. <laughs> but I will say, if that is coming out in December 2015, it makes me think that we're probably not going to get a season two of Agent Carter. Eh, true. No. But again, they could intertwine Agent Carter into everything else. Right. It doesn't have to be its own show at this point, in my opinion, but it was good. I liked it. It was a good it was. episodes. If you haven't seen it already, go pick it up. Agent Carter, it was a great eight hours. We all enjoyed it very much, and it was a great ride, especially to have in the mid-season break here. So I think you two will agree with me there, right? No arguments here. <laughs> okay. So moving on, we had some more awesome Avenger stuff come out this week, and we're just going to get the hype machine going more and more and more as we go into May here. April's just going to be the Avengers Marvel hype. <laughs> and in this particular case, we got another wonderful TV spot for the movie. Okay, so this is, it's not very long. It's like, what, a minute? But it's wonderful. It's kind of riffing on the whole scene from the first Avengers movie where Tony Stark's running down each member of the team, but with a little character moment from everyone, little bits of scenes and things like that, a little bit of dialogue, and it's so fun. I don't know. I'm torn between, as my favorite moments, Black Widow's I'm always picking up after you boys, and <laughs> Thor's Is That All You Got? And Captain America's just kind of, oh, you did not really say that. Look at him. And then he says something to him afterwards, and I forget what, because I'm giggling too hard every time. <laughs> oh, and, and Cap throwing a motorcycle. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, the good thing about forgetting it is it's on YouTube, so you could watch it yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah, just watch it like eight times in a row. It's wonderful. <laughs> eight, 80, 800, 8,000, it doesn't matter. Just keep adding zeros. You know what else you can watch on an endless loop is that scene of Chris Evans ripping a log apart with his bare hands. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing that in... I have my doubts on whether that's styrofoam or not. I think that was real. Although I do mm. heat with- I'm sorry. Something that somebody brought up. Maybe I saw it on Twitter and somebody here brought that up because they mentioned that the cabin that Sky was dropped off at was one of Fury's safe houses. Yes. Do you think that the cabin in the preview bit that we saw was one of Fury's safe houses and possibly the same one? Well, wasn't it white? I don't know, but... Yeah, the one in the preview looked like more of a house yeah. than the cabin. Yeah, everyone on Tumblr has been joking around that Hawkeye like secretly owns a cabin and a farm. And, it's just, oh, I think they did say it was Hawkeye's. Anyway. So I heat with wood up at the family lake home. And we do... Uh, my family has been heating with wood for a while in different houses. So you come from a long line of men who rip apart logs with their bare hands? <laughs> That's right. Well, we use a hydraulic trailer log splitter now. But if you can nail them just right with a wedge just a little bit and start the split, if it's dry enough, you can do that on your own. So I'm guessing that might have been what the stunt is because ripping a log apart <laughs> that's all together. It takes a lot of force. And Cajun Sean brought up a great quote in the chat. He said, you walk out that door and you're an Avenger. And when Hawkeye <laughs> was saying that to Quicksilver and uh, Scarlet Witch. So I, that's awesome. Okay. So in other Avengers news, I'm not sure if this was Marvel machine related, but definitely pretty cool. A lot of comic book or geeky outlets picked up on this over the weekend. It's an Avengers themed an apartment. And if you haven't seen this yet, check out one of these stories. I'll put them in the show notes. 
you'll see, you know, Wing, for those of you that don't know, the person that started this podcast, his name's Night Wing. He's on the Gunna Geek Network. He has a variety of different podcasts, including Legends Podcasts on movies and uh, Starling Tribune on the CW television show Arrow. And he loves Batman. So every once in a while, he'll bring up this bat cave sort of uh, hotel room apartment or whatever. And he'll say, yeah, I want to have that when I grow up. I want to have this apartment when I grow up. It's awesome. <laughs> I really like the shield mirror. <laughs> it is good, isn't it? I wonder if it breaks itself every month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, it's all great. And the big giant A that's next to the kitchen. Is it the kitchen bar or, or whatever? It's awesome. Love it. Awesome decor. Awesome artwork. It's just... Uh, I wonder how much all that costs. I, n- I never took a look at the story and said, okay, this costs X amount. I'll bet you it's a pretty penny. So, all right. So we talked about this before and we got a couple of new stories in the show notes about Joss Wheaton hidden about other characters pairing in the Avengers. Right. So we said, you know, we'd love if we saw Carol Danvers there, which, you know, my fangirl heart would just burst, but we know that Falcon's going to be there. There's a pretty good chance. Black Panther and Doctor Strange will be there just because their movies are coming up soon. Yeah. Cage and Sean mentioned that in the chat. Right. And then there's also the off chance that Spider-Man might show up first here before he shows up in Captain America 3. If they get him cast. If they get him cast. And then there's some speculation that Spider-Woman could potentially show up as well. Spider-Woman or Spider-Gwen? Spider-Woman. Okay. I don't think they're going to do Spider-Gwen. Spider-Gwen's picked up a lot of momentum recently. Yeah, but it involves like parallel universes and stuff, which they haven't really addressed at this point. No, not yet. I think eventually they'll go there. Kind of like what they did with X-Men in the last movie with the time dilation and stuff. Depends on how well the comic does, I think, in the long run. It hasn't really been getting the best reviews lately, to my knowledge. Mm. The writing has not been spectacular. Yeah. Ha ha, but um, ha ha What you did there, I see it. Definitely. And then also, there's a bunch of information out there. There's a video of the Axis Hollywood joined forces with Marvel. And they did a video of behind the scenes on the set of the Avengers Tower set that Tony Stark has in the Avengers Tower for the Avengers. And it's pretty interesting. It's going to be a major set piece. Apparently, it's a huge set for a movie to construct. And it, Bruce Banner, <laughs> Mark Ruffle, was joking that the construction of the set probably cost more than five of his past movies that he has made, <laughs> which is probably true because he's done a lot of those low budget rom-coms, but yeah, it's uh, definitely a huge set and I can't wait to see it. We, and of course, we see it in the trailers being blown up and everything too, so it'll be fun to see that. And then this was a very interesting story that popped up just recently in the last day or so. Avengers Age of Ultron Fun Facts as released by Disney Studios. Yeah, so I love reading just little trivia bits about everything, basically. And this is from comicbook.com, and it's a bunch of Age of Ultron fun facts, such as the various upgrades that Tony Stark has made to various Avengers, like Hulk's stretchy pants (laughs) and Hawkeye's bow. Which is now maroon. Yes, and Cap's shield. Yep. And his quiver can hold nine arrows. (laughs) (laughs) you're welcome uh let's see there's also things like a lot of stuff that we already knew like another new character is vision played by paul bettany who had previously voiced jarvis and we're like yeah we knew thanks (laughs) but then there's stuff like when they were filming in seoul south korea they were able to use drones and remote control cars Mm -hmm. for the cameras to get some different angles so it's worth a read there's some fun stuff the last little bit about the uh, costume designer dressing them for the party scene was pretty great, especially with Thor. Yeah, and then there's a... I can't remember why I saw it, but there's another interview. Maybe we'll talk about it a little later. And they're talking... It's Chris Hemsworth and Robert Downey Jr. talking about the costumes that they were, their updated costumes. And they were saying that, yep, yep, they're a little bit more functional, a little bit more enhanced. 
And then the interviewer said, are they any easier to wear? And they said, nope, <laughs> they still suck. <laughs> oh, and there's some information about the Hulkbuster. Yes. Very, that's probably, in retrospect, my favorite bit of information on here. Yes, yeah, so spoilers if you don't want to hear about this. We'll talk about it for the next minute or so. Yeah, remember how we were all like, but they're such good friends. How could he do the Hulkbuster armor? <laughs> well, you find that out. Yeah. Apparently, it's contained in a satellite that's orbiting and can be called whenever needed. And they developed it together because they are such good friends. Because they're bros. science bros. Science bros! There you go. Okay, and then moving on, because we're going to hear a lot more about Avengers over the next month. In Captain America Civil War, it starts shooting on April 1st, and I thought it might be a April Fool's jokes, but it's not. It's going to start filming in about a week here, so it, it'll be great to see that move forward. Some of the plot is revealed, nothing that we haven't heard already. We're talking about Civil War here, so we've talked about it extensively in the last few casts. If you want to pick that up, you can go back and listen to that. But the most important part is they will be filming this when Avengers 2 is released. So uh, I don't know if they'll have any time to actually go and see the movie because about most of the Avengers are actually going to be in Civil War. So if they needed to film some shawarma scenes, they could just be like, oh, no, this is a scene for Captain America. That's true. Yeah. Could, you know what? It could be one of those scenes that they've announced that they need like the thousands of casts there, like mm -hmm. 8,000 people and stuff like that. That'd be cool as a shawarma scene. <laughs> so moving on, we have confirmation finally. We've had rumors galore, but we finally have confirmation. Yes, the Russo brothers will definitely be directing Avengers 3 and 4, F Infinity Wars Parts 1 and 2. It's definitely happening, guys. Definitely. 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 And this is coming as a shock to absolutely no one. <laughs> so this means they'll have three movies, right? Versus Joss's two? Yes. All right. No, four. Four. Oh, yeah. Four. Cap 2 and 3, and then Avengers 3 and 4. Yeah. Joss is getting old. <laughs> <laughs> he had to do it all by himself, though. They get to split the work. Oh, okay. So kind of even out. So the average is still two each. All right. We can do maths. <laughs> Are you sure? So somebody else that can do maths is Marvel because apparently they auditioned a 16-year-old for Spider-Man. Right. A young actor named Matthias Ward. And I haven't seen anything he's been in. Apparently, he was a child actor in Weeds, yeah. which I haven't watched. Nope. But yeah, he looks like a 14-year-old, actually. They say he's 16. <laughs> looks like a 13-year-old. <laughs> Right, but that does say that they're definitely looking for somebody very young, 16, 17 years old, and they want to keep Spider-Man young and not have somebody that's going to be 30 or so when they're trying to do a third movie. Yeah, it's always a crapshoot when you're talking about young actors, because you have people like Will Wheaton, right? You see what he <laughs> turned out. Still a great actor. I mean, I, he can act however he wants. He just was not interested in acting anymore. So if you're talking about a kid, oh, and do you either you two watch Walking Dead? Uh, yeah, yes. but I've kind of fallen off of it this season. Okay, so you're not current. No, but I know what Carl looks like. Yeah, well, <laughs> Carl was actually on the Talking Dead for the first time this past Sunday, and uh, it was very interesting seeing him on the set. And in the casting news of Spider-Man here, they were talking about how they had to cast Carl as a really young, you know, 10-year-old boy, basically, and say, okay, is this guy going to skip out on us eventually and we're going to have to write him on the show? Or is this somebody that we can actually keep for a very long time? And they were pretty certain that they were going to keep him for a long time. So uh, it's tricky with a 16-year-old, but that you're yeah. trying to cast for 10, 15 years, but it's Marvel. Well, and you never know how they're going to age, because I don't know if you ever, either of you ever watched it, but the 4400... One of the mm -hmm. actors they got for that show when he started was supposed to be 17. And then two years later, he had aged like 10 years all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I never watched that show. I wanted to. I just never had time. And that's kind of funny. Okay. Yeah. So in like news, we also have a statement from Joe Caseta. Yeah. You know, he's just saying what we all know, that they have to get Spider-Man right this time. Duh. They can't screw it up. Duh. Which... Yeah, duh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Vin Diesel is out promoting Fast 7 right now, and as he should. Fast 7, Furious 7? Yeah, whatever you want to call it, Fast and Furious 7. <laughs> and he's being asked an awful lot about his Marvel movie future, 
And there's a couple of interviews that we have with him stacked up one-on-one here. And they caught him. It was the first interview of the junket. And they, it was the first question out of the gate. And they caught him by surprise. And they're like, okay, so you're voicing Groot, but Marvel's approached you about in Inhumans. What are your future Marvel plans? And he had to do the toe dance. It was obvious. <laughs> he was like, Marvel hasn't talked to me about this. What do I say? What do I say? <laughs> So he skillfully tap dance around it. And he's like, well, Marvel seems to have everybody's pinned me as an inhuman. And of course, I'm going to be back as Groot in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. So definitely, yeah, kind of thing. <laughs> so it was, <laughs> it, was a, it was a funny one. But also in the awe department, he claimed that Groot and him playing or voicing Groot really helped him through the morning of Paul Walker as well. Because Aww. it's a character that can regenerate, so he was regenerating himself as he was speaking the lines of Groot. So it was Vin Diesel, Marvel, love there. You know, weirdly enough, this weekend I was somehow the Fast and the Furious expert in my group of friends. <laughs> oh, I have seen half of a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I know all this stuff about the movies. I guess through osmosis from listening to people who are on the Gun and Geek Network or who have previously been involved with the GWC Network. Because I have seen half of, I guess, Fast and Furious number five or whichever one that one is. <laughs> yeah. And somehow I'm like, okay, so the one that's coming out, this one has to do with this. It deals all back to Tokyo Drift. And it has to do with this bad guy. And he killed this person. And they're like, how, do you, how, how many of these movies have you seen? I'm like, half. <laughs> I've seen the first one and like bits and pieces of the second. Okay. So, and I have no idea what's going on. So I had no choice, right? I'm on a podcast, Starling Tribune with Nightwing, who is a huge Fast and Furious fan. I'm also on another podcast, Voices of Defiance, about the sci-fi show Defiance with Sean O'Hara, who is also a huge Fast and Furious fan. I had no choice. I had to sit down and watch them. So I did. <laughs> I watched all six of them. Bang, bang, bang. And it was a fun watch. I mean, there's some incontinuity time stuff there that I guess is being... Fa I did not see Fast 7 this weekend. So I don't know how they fix that. Well, it's not out until this coming weekend, I think. Oh, I thought it was out last weekend. No, at some point, I do want to sit down and watch them all. I started thinking about it while I was watching the commercial for this most recent one. If you think of these movies as a series where the cars are their power armor and it's basically an anime... It makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Although they don't treat their power armor very well. They tend to crack it up. Oh, come on. Like anyone else's power armor in any mecha anime gets treated any better. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Pacific Rim 2, it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> you, whether whether you want it or not, you want I it, I don't. <laughs> I did not see it on a big enough screen, I think, to get excited about it. Oh, maybe that I was it. I saw it like a whole bunch of times. I love that movie so much. <laughs> I think I saw it on my 32-inch TV rather than in the yeah. theater. I was warned. I was like, you have to watch this one in theaters. It's so good in theaters. And I was like, well, I want to. And then it was out of theaters before I got a chance to. I think Ferris was the one who told me that. In matter of fact, he wanted to meet me to see it. And it's a couple hour drive for each one of us to meet in the middle. And I just didn't get that. Yeah. It, well, we'll see. Uh, Lauren, for you, I'll, I'll make sure I see Pacific Rim 2, and, and we'll see how that goes. When does that come out? Are they just Oh, I don't know. There's a comic that was just announced today. It's a prequel comic, so it's going to be all robot versus kaiju fights all the time. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. <laughs> I still think that Captain America's suit in Avengers 2 is going to have some power on it. I think those red strips mean something, but for now, it just looks like normal fabric, but it's Tony Starkable. We'll see. <laughs> okay, so moving on, we do have several X-Men stories, don't we, Lauren? Yes, we do. So first of all, I think it was today that Brian Singer announced Jubilee is going to be an X-Men apocalypse. And Jubilee has been in previous X-Men movies, always played by different actresses, and kind of never in the foreground. But today it was revealed that Lana Condor will be Jubilee. And I looked her up on IMDb earlier, and I don't think she's been in anything. Nope, but nothing. But she looks good. And she's actually an Asian actress playing Jubilee, which is a big step up from the Generation <laughs> X movie from the 90s. So, well done. Well done, indeed. Yes. We also had some notice that some actors will only be coming back in cameo mode for X-Men Apocalypse. 
Uh, yeah, there's a lot of rumors about, it's from Latino Review and uh, other places are reporting on it. The review is coming from an Instagram account from Latino Review, and they're saying that Wolverine and Storm, uh, Hugh Jackman's Wolverine and Halle Berry's Storm in particular, will only be putting in cameos. And we'll see who else shows up in big parts and small parts. I mean, it's an X-Men movie, so various other mutants will be showing up in some variety. Like The main reason why I don't completely hate the third X-Men movie that Singer did not direct <laughs> was that I could pick out in like kind of the last big fight scene. It's like, oh, hey, there's this character. Oh, hey, there's that character. Oh, hey, there's this character, but they got their power set wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so also, uh, this was kind of confusing. I think it came out late last week after we put the podcast out or recorded a podcast. Jennifer Lawrence had something to say about her future with the X-Men franchise. Yep. She is done with X-Men after X-Men Apocalypse. Well, she doesn't need the money anymore. I wonder, nope. I read the story. I didn't see uh, why. She was very curt, very succinct, said, yeah, I'm done. I don't know what. I don't know. It might just be that she might think that the story is complete after this. It might just be that she's done working with these. Just she feels that her time is done on this. It might be that she's sick of the makeup. Yeah. It might be that she has other projects that she wants to work on. She's, I mean, her star is rising. After the Hunger Games and after right. this and after just everything else that she's been in. Well, part of it is the way she looks. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, her character in X-Men is almost naked or basically naked. And she did have those pictures leaked on the Internet. And I'm just wondering if that had something to do with it because of the way the character had to be played. But uh, who knows? Because nothing further was said about it. There is no new information. It's just that she's done after Apocalypse. So I wonder if they're going to recast the character or if they're going to be done with the character. Uh, who knows? Then we also have a couple of small little Fantastic Four pieces. First off is a kind of an interview with Miles Teller saying the more superhero stuff you get to do, the cooler it is. Well, yeah. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I'll put the link in the show notes. And then also, we did get to see the, I can't really call it a costume, but how the Fantastic Four brick guy looks. Yeah. The thing. The thing. Yeah. So, the best headline that I saw for it today, and I think Op was the one who retweeted it this morning, and I saw it was, uh, we get to see Jamie Bell's thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I giggled so hard. Well, keep giggling, because we're going to be talking a little bit about Ant-Man here. That's a movie that's going to get made, guys, or that got made, and that <laughs> yep. we're probably going to see. Well, first of all, they're saying that Ant-Man could be the most improv-heavy Marvel movie yet. Oh, the script was that good. <laughs> well, Adam Reed, the director of it, did direct Bring It On, which, okay, shameful admission, I did like this movie when I was in high school. Oh, Bring It On? I still like Bring yeah. It On. Yeah. The first one? It had Eliza Dushku. Yeah. Yes. And he did episodes of Upright Citizens Brigade, which is, by the way, if you have never seen it, the most amazing show. This week, I surprised my husband with season three, which I did not realize was out on video. And it still holds up. That show was so good. So find it. And he also directed some episodes of The Weird Al Show, which was also amazing. So he's good with comedy. And a lot of the cast members like Paul Rudd, Judy Greer, they're funny people. Judy Greer is great. She's been in a lot of really good stuff, and she's on Archer. Hello? She's Cheryl. <laughs> Carol. <laughs> Carol. Charlene. Charlene. Crystal. <laughs> but it might not be so bad that a lot of these people improv. Yeah. Whatever the script came out to be, whatever the filming came out to be, Marvel's about to release this movie, so... It's on the calendar. Yeah. Of course, they're in full Avengers mode. And I suspect that right after that tale of the Avengers starts waning at the beginning of June, that we're going to see a lot of hype on Ant-Man. Maybe not as much as Guardians of the Galaxy, but they're going to have to spin this some way because a large majority of the comic book fans and Marvel fanboys out there just are not getting excited about this movie. <laughs> just it isn't happening. But we also do have another article about Ant-Man with Danny Collins. Well, actually, it's with Bobby Cannavale, yep. 
who was in a movie called Danny Collins. Yes. There you and go. he is in Ant-Man. And I know him mostly because of Boardwalk Empire. Oh. And he's been in a bunch of other movies. He's in Station Agent. He's been in, oh, geez, what else is he in? I want to say he was in an episode of Louie on FX. He's been in a bunch of stuff. And every time I see him, all I can think is, I've seen your penis because he was <laughs> just butt naked in an episode of Boardwalk Empire getting strangled by a hooker. So he's going to be in this. Probably not butt naked getting strangled by a hooker. <laughs> Darn. No, isn't this uh, PG-13? I think it's PG-13. As PG far as I know, it's yeah. PG-13. Right. But he's talking about a bunch of other stuff. He's talking about working with Al Pacino. He's talking about family. And then they ask him about working on Ant-Man. And they're like, well, you can't talk about the plot, but can you talk about what it's like making the movie? So he's talking about just the experience of making the movie. And he talks about the improv that they did on the set. and that it was a lot of fun. He mentions that it didn't feel like Thor. It felt more like Guardians of the Galaxy, which I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like maybe it'll be a fun movie. It's not going to be a full train wreck. <laughs> no. Yeah. It, I, it has a good cast is the thing. It does. The production has been troubled, <laughs> as we have repeatedly and constantly pointed out. <laughs> but with the cast and with the director, maybe it won't be so bad. Maybe. Maybe. So, we'll I'm, I'm will, as, if it's funny, and if it's, let's face it, just not a train wreck, <laughs> I'm willing to give it a chance. Yeah, we'll see. It's hard to tell, right? And we'll see what the early test screenings give us, but in the meantime, all we have are stories and the fact that we've had massive crew issues. So, Well, moving on to something good. We have heard that John Williams is set to record Star Wars The Force Awakens score in Los Angeles, and that is different than any other Star Wars score that he has recorded in the past. It's been in England, I believe. Yes, he usually performs with the London Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, so this will be different, and I don't know if this is John getting older and just doesn't want to travel over there or cost me. I have no idea. But it's uh, going to happen in Los Angeles, so I would love to be in the studio for that, or theater for that. So, I can't wait. Yeah. My first thought was age, because he is, I believe, in his 70s. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who are very active right up in their 70s and 80s. And in some cases, they're in 90s. Christopher Lee is still recording metal albums. Yeah, Stan Lee. He's 93. Yeah, Stan Lee's still traveling everywhere, still going to cons. Gonna hopefully see him at a con in May coming up soon. But I'm every person's different. Right. So. It, you even had that William Shatner issue where he couldn't attend Leonard Nimoy's funeral because he already had another charity event he was going to. He was in a lose-lose situation at that point. And I think he made the correct decision in the grand scheme of things right there. But it just goes to show you, when you get to be 80, it's in 70s or 90s or whatever, it, it is more difficult to travel. Especially, hey, I know each of you two have traveled recently. It's a pain to get on a plane nowadays. It used to be fun. Uh, yeah. I haven't had to fly lately. I drove. <laughs> well, even no, that's a pain. I, I just got back from a trip where I flew, and yeah, it's a pain. It's... Oh, Richard put in the chat that John Williams is 83, so... 83, okay. God. Yeah, that I thought is I just remembered his 70th birthday. It turns out I'm remembering his 80th birthday. <laughs> yeah. And once again, my memory has slipped. I don't remember time anymore. <laughs> well, I mean, he's been involved in movies. If you take a look at his filmography, he is amazing. I don't think he's got one single musical flop and hardly any movie flops in the bunch. When John Williams is attached to your movie, it's going to be awesome. And he's been in the the game for a very long time. I once asked a question to a group of friends, you know, who is the next John Williams? And we could not come up with anybody that would come remotely close to John Williams. And this includes Ferris, too. And Ferris and I bannered this about for... And Ferris, for you, those of you that don't know, he's huge in the music business, tends to go on the metal side more, but he knows a lot, about, <laughs> a lot about the music business in general. And uh, we just could not come up with it. We found some very cool existing composers and new composers like Bear McCreary, but McCreary, it, McCreary sorry, Bear, I'm sorry, buddy. 
I don't think he's listening. <laughs> In case he is. He might be. He, does. He, scores, yeah. <laughs> he scores Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah. So if you, if you have somebody like that, uh, we were postulating that Bear might be the best possibility we have to replace John Williams, but he's not there yet. And even Bear knows that. So it's it's no big deal. But this is a big deal in geekdom and I really enjoy music and I really enjoy John Williams music. So there you go. And Dis- you know, Star Wars is owned by Disney. This is a Marvel podcast. Marvel is owned by Disney. That's why we're putting it in. So take that. Cajun John in the chat said, it's not Danny Elfman. It, true. <laughs> John Williams is not Danny. Although I do have to agree with, I think it was Jenny Trout on Twitter. Okay. So Danny Elfman scored Fifty Shades of Grey, which I have no intention of seeing nope. because I have read way hotter porn and <laughs> fanfic. This was basically glorified abuse. And Danny Elfman scored it. I would go see it. First of all, if and only if A, you saw penis, which you don't, and B, Danny Elfman scored it exactly like he scored every other Tim Burton movie he has ever done. And they started playing Oingo Boingo at some point. <laughs> like, they just start playing, like, the tinkly, quirky, you know, like the Edward Scissorhand music at some point. That is the only way I would go see that movie. <laughs> I respect your decision. Right. Right. All right. Any more news, ladies? I think that's all the news that's unfit to discuss. <laughs> all right. <laughs> How many times have I said penis? <laughs> you can say penis as much as you want. Penis, Laura. penis, penis, <laughs> vagina, vagina, vagina. <laughs> and with that, Taint. we're going to move on to the feedback. <laughs> oh, I've had wine. <laughs> <laughs> Winecast with Lauren are the best podcasts. Okay, so on Twitter, we got a lot of great feedback. I'm going to start off with Andy Migna. He said, before the stinger at the end, how did Agent 33, a.k.a. Kara, so yes, Kara, learn how she looked like without the mask? And that's a question that I had as well. I don't know if they're going to explain it or not. I guess we're just going to have to say that in some way, interaction with Bakshi, she figured it out. Or... She went through the base and got her file from the base. Who knows? Because I have to think that Talbot has a roster, a binder full of shield agents. Full of women? A binder full of women. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe she Googled herself. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. She found a bunch of selfies on Facebook. Yeah, she found an awkward picture of herself in high school in like a band uniform. (laughs) She's like, like, is this what you wanted? And he's like, ah. (laughs) And then friend of the cast, Jay, who is a co-host of both Haley and Maya on two different podcasts, he runs the Gallifrey Public Radio, Doctor Who podcast on the Guinea Geek Network, and he also is a co-host of mine on the Starling Tribune, talking about Arrow. He said, despite my, meaning Stargate Pioneers, attempts to thwart me, I finally got my lanyard. Now, where are the snacks? And there's a picture of him with his Providence lanyard saying... Gimme, gimme, gimme. And for that, I had to say back to him, that looks great, but I have to concede that the best Providence lanyard on the Geek Geek Network right now belongs to Haley. It does. <laughs> Y'all know Ken has. Because it's got ming signature on it, and again, for those of you that didn't hear last week, ming is going to be at Dallas Comic Con, so you yes. could get a hold of your own Providence badge and have her sign it and be just as cool as Haley. You could. And then, but I did it first, so I'm cooler. Yeah. <laughs> At Mr. Paracletes tweeted us and he said, Did you guys hear about this theory? I doubt it's accurate, but a fun read. And did either of you two ladies have a chance to look this up? I yeah. just looked this over and I have read this in several fanfics. I was <laughs> first going to say, Of course, Loki has a kid. It's slept near. Because this is mythology, people. The horse that Odin rides in the very first Thor movie. Yeah, that's Loki's kid. <laughs> I am cool. not even kidding you. Look up Norse mythology. I believe you 100%. Yes. Loki has weird monster babies. This is canon in Norse mythology. Well, Loki is actually not an Asgardian, so yeah, I could see definitely <laughs> having weird kids. It depends on who he pairs up with. Well, in <laughs> the actual myth, Loki, like, to distract somebody, I guess, I forget, it has something to do with Thor. But to distract this horse, he also turns into just this beautiful girl horse. And this, like, majestic horse 
gets frisky with him. And then nine <laughs> months later, he has an eight-legged horse. And Odin keeps it, and that's Slepnir. Cajun Sean in the chat said Hela is his daughter. That is yes. also true. Mm -hmm. Hela, who rules the realm of Hell, H-E-L, which is the realm of the dead, yeah. the non-warrior dead, is technically Loki's daughter, which in the Journey into Mystery comics leads to some really messed up and awesome plot points. It's pretty great. Okay, so moving on, Christy at Adana Girl tweeted us, as she normally does. It's great hearing from you, Christy. We really appreciate your patronage to the cast and enjoy interacting with you. She has all the best geek swag. She does, because mm -hmm. this time around, she came up with this cool Groot t-shirt made by, I guess, one of y'all's favorite artists. I've never heard of this artist yes. before, so please enlighten me. Okay, so I guess it was last year when I was on vacation with some friends. I walked out and a friend of mine is wearing a t-shirt that has Princess Leia in one of my favorite paintings from Disney's Haunted Mansion. You know the one with the ballerina who's walking on a tightrope, and then when the picture stretches down, it turns out that the tightrope is above a pit of alligators. Mm. So it's like that, but instead of a pit of alligators, it's a uh, Dianoga. So I was like, oh my god, that's two of my favorite things right there. So she's like, you have to check out this artist. So I look, and I find the webpage, and I'm like, ah, I need this, and I need all this stuff. So, so far, I only have that shirt, the Princess Leia Haunted Mansion one. But she has so many awesome geek stuff. Like, she has this whole bunch of, like, Disney Doctor Who crossover ones. Yeah. And she has a bunch of Marvel ones. And she has Wait just a, a bunch of, like, Art Nouveau ones. Is Doctor Who a Disney princess? No, doc the, the Disney princesses are companions. Uh -huh. And the Doctor, it's the TARDIS showing up to come collect the Disney princesses to go off on their adventures. Yeah. And it's pretty awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. She, she just has this wide variety of great prints and shirts and just everything awesome she has just some beautiful stuff since i last checked and most recently t fury had her agent carter shirt and she also has some groot stuff and just basically if you have a taste in geek stuff especially comics disney doctor who she probably has it star wars also star wars awesome so i'm gonna follow her on twitter as soon as we get off the cast here she is pretty great okay then moving on over to Facebook, we had a geek back, basically, with Paulo Silva said, And you, I did not expect that you would read my message. Thank you. Legends and Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. are my favorite podcast. Trying to get some time to see Gotham Flash and Arrow because I want to become a fan of the rest of the podcasts on the network. From this little corner of Europe again, thank you. And I will say... Out of the three shows that you mentioned there, Gotham, Flash, and Arrow, I would heartily recommend, even though I'm on the Arrow podcast, to start with <laughs> The Flash, because that is an awesome show. And then I would go Arrow, and then if you happen to have time, I would go Gotham. And then you can check out Crimson Comet for <laughs> poop jokes and puns about The Flash. <laughs> yes, you can. So that is definitely what I would recommend, but... All three of those shows are pretty good. I, Gotham gets amazing ratings, so and it's Batman, so you gotta love it. And Arrow is probably the best non-Batman show on the air <laughs> right now. It's the Batmaniest show on the air right now. I remember when he got the Arrow cave. Yeah, the quiver. <laughs> Everyone's like, "Oh my god, this is Batman! This show is so Batman!" He Batman's harder than Bruce Wayne has ever Batmaned. This is true. I so need to catch up on Arrow. You, you do. really do. I know. It's just, since Manu Bennett is no longer on the show, I've lost a little bit of the steam. <laughs> you know, I started my cousin on season one of Arrow while we were at Comic-Con together, because she had never seen it. So we watched like the first four episodes, and I was like, wow, he had his shirt on a lot less in season one than he does now. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently he's like, I like food, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, you got Ray Palmer on the show, too, you know, hey? Oh, yeah. It's good, good, good. Slay Wilson is good, too. I enjoy the show. Matter yeah, fact, just, ah, uh, Manu Bennett. Just <laughs> give me all the Manu Bennett. I'm just, I'm here, I'm making grabby hands right now. Just <laughs> give me. So, full disclosure, I am in the middle of this podcast, and all my co-hosts on Starling Tribune are watching Arrow, right? And I'm getting all these text messages, watch the show, show. we can talk about it, watch the show, show. I'm like, I'm podcasting, leave me alone. Okay. So, also... Adam, our great listener, has given us a voicemail for the week. You ladies want to hear it? Yes. Yay. Hey, guys. Uh, this episode was a bit slower than I thought it would be, but 
Maybe that's because I was actually able to watch The Flash as it aired for once. All in all, I'd say it's a setup for next week's episode, which looks like it's going to be the right after Captain America Winter Soldier episode for the season. <laughs> nice twist with Adama Shield having a helicarrier. Really didn't see that coming. I was making SGC jokes to myself during all the scenes there because it looks very similar until Hunter opens that door. I can't wait to hear what you guys think. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you very much, Adam. We enjoy hearing from you every week, especially every week that you're not on the podcast. I would agree. It's a slower episode, but oh, yes, Helicarrier. Can't wait till next week. (laughs) All right. So do you ladies have any other feedback that you'd like to bring to the table? I don't think so. All right. We're going to walk it out now. We had fun this week, and we hope you did too. We would love to hear from you guys. We would love to hear about your feedback on the episode like Adam just sent. We would love to hear about your Science of Marvel questions, kind of what we were asked about with the mask on Agent 33, and then how awesome people like Peggy Carter or Captain Marvel are or Melinda May. We'd love to hear about that. And... Next week, we'll be talking about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 2, Episode 15, One Door Closes. Looks like there's going to be a heck of a lot of fun happening there. And we have a lot of place to contact us. We have a website, legendsofshield.com, a voicemail line at 844-THE-BUS-1. That is 844-843-2871. We have a Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr page. We have a YouTube channel, which you can find the audio podcasts on with our great logo playing in the background. And don't forget, we have forums. I've been having a lot of fun in the forums this past week. That's forums.gunageek.com or on the Tapatalk app, you can search for Gunna Geek, all one word, no spaces. And don't forget all the other great places you can listen to us, Mixcloud, Spreaker, SoundCloud, TuneIn, and all the places. So I just want to say again, thank you all very much for stopping by and listening we appreciate every one of you that listens to this podcast right and we also appreciate all the feedback we get from you guys thank you to everyone who sent us tweets this week and especially those of you who participated in the live tweeting and andy who participated in the delayed live tweeting (laughs) thank you guys so much i'd like to thank everybody who has commented on our facebook we are very happy to get comments there we're very happy to see them we're very happy to see you This is not on Facebook, but Andy, I'm sorry I grossed you out (laughs) with that discussion from last week. Yeah, Um, sorry, man. It's it's kind of what I'm good at, grossing people out. Everyone needs a skill. Yeah, I'm good at it. For Again, any biological, medical questions, that's what I'm here for. Let me put it this way. (laughs) When I was editing the podcast and had to re-listen to that spot about 5, 10, 15 times, I was grossed out every single time that I listened to it, too. I was like, ooh, should I just cut this out? Ooh. (laughs) You're welcome. There you go. And then also, thank you very much for all the voicemails. Thank you very much for everybody that joined our new chat. We are now included in the Guinea Geek Network's chat wing common chat, so... Come on to gunnageek.com slash live. You will see the chat box there when we're broadcasting live. Sign up for a chat wing account. You can also log in on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, basically every social media thing out there. You can go ahead, log in and be part of the chat. And we would love to hear from you as we talk about our Marvel Universe. So until next week, I'm Agent Stargate Pioneer. I'm Agent Haley. And I'm Agent Lauren. Bye. See you guys next week. Bye. Later. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you'll find all of our contact information in other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod and can be found at incompetech.com. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual host and do not represent Legends, Stream, or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation. No infringement is intended.